All right. Thank you very much, Carsten, for your, for your kind words. Um, in this session, we're going to talk a little bit about architectures. Uh, should be interesting also for a, a core developer, Apex developer, because you all need a basic knowledge about uh, the Apex architecture. What kind of architectures are possible? Um, yeah, and one size fits all is the question we'll soon be answering. Um, yeah, my name is uh, Niels de Bruyne. Um, I'm a business unit manager responsible for low code as such uh, at uh, MTRG. Um, I'm a Dutch guy, uh, although I live in Germany for a very long time now, but I actually was born and raised in, in the Netherlands. And um, yeah, I, I sought out for, for a nice wife and I found one in Germany. So that's why I, I came over to Germany, uh, got married, got three daughters, and I'm living in Ratingen. And, uh, as um, Shakib was stalling, talking about uh, Reston, where that lies, Rating is, is nearby Dusseldorf. And you could say that at MTIG, uh, we have our Apex headquarters in, in Germany. Um, so, um, yeah, I'm responsible for all the low code activity in the company, uh, together with uh, a team of colleagues. Carsten also mentioned 40 people uh, we have now on board. So, that's growing uh, steadily. Uh, we have an own portal on which we uh, share our knowledge with, uh, which is called apex.mt-ig.com. Uh, so have a visit over there. Uh, there are some nice tutorials there, YouTube videos and stuff. Um, yeah, I've got a long track record with Apex. Carsten also mentioned that. And uh, I'm also a certified professional uh, and I'm an ACE director, uh, which basically means I do a little bit for the community and that got uh, recognized by Oracle, which is, uh, which is great. Uh, and also talking about giving back to the community, I'm also very active at DOARC, which is the German Oracle user group. And uh, here I'm a director of the development community and I'm also the initiator uh, and uh, held the, the conference chair of our three-day conference, Apex Connect in Germany. And uh, last year we had 380 people attending this conference. Uh, but of, as you all know, um, of course, there is the corona thing, uh, corona thing going on. Um, so we had to actually cancel the, uh, the conference after hard uh, work putting it all up, uh, which is uh, it's very sad. But uh, I've got an alternative to announce for those of you who are not on Twitter. Uh, we have planned our online edition uh, of Apex Connect that will be held on the 5th and 6th of May this year. Um, the schedule is coming up soon. Uh, we've got loads of sessions planned and uh, it's free. Yeah? Just like Apex at Home is, it's completely free. Um, so I'm, I'm looking forward to that uh, yeah, event. Um, the registration should open soon, uh, and uh, you can have a look at uh, the website apex.doark.org, uh, apex and um, uh, anytime soon you can actually start registering for, for this. So it's completely free, and uh, all sessions will all be also be recorded. So um, if you're not in the, in the appropriate time zone, because this is held in Europe, uh, or you don't have any time, um, please feel free to afterwards uh, have a look at the recordings. Okay, so uh, my slides, if you're uh, interested in my slides, I've put them already online on our knowledge base website, uh, knowledgebase.mt-ig.com. There's also a direct link uh, on the bottom of this slide. Uh, where you can actually also download all the slides or you can look at it uh, in line. And I actually want to briefly mention this, this knowledge base, mtag.com, because it's actually a quite nice uh, site. And when I open up here, um, you can see the, the slides in line of the application. And it's actually a very good use case for a faceted search being used uh, on, on this site. So we had an internship um do someone doing an internship at a company and he took like two weeks uh to put this site all up uh which is which is really great uh, and you can actually search for it or you can actually use the, the facets here um to to yeah enter a tag and and look for more information so if you're interested in, in apex content 
have a look over here. There is uh, loads of content here in line that's coming from various sources, not only content coming from our company. So that might be of interest for you. So let's start our topic, Apex Architectures. Um, as you can see, all those buildings look a little bit different and they're all were designed for a different purpose. And the same is true for Apex Architectures. Uh, so you have uh, different kinds of possibilities. I would like to show you uh, some of the possibilities you, you have uh, and we also see in our customer projects. And uh, so you can take advantage of, of that. Uh, so let's, let's start. Um, yeah, first, why build yourself, get cloudy? Uh, so if you're looking um, for, for a quick way to start up with, with an Apex environment, um, a, a cloud version might be the, the right option to start off. So you don't have the hassle to install it all yourself. Uh, and you can take advantage of some free services as well. Um, so if you're not uh, complaining about data residing in, in the cloud, then I would definitely have a look into that. Of course, you can uh, start with apex.oracle.com, which is the, the quickest method. Um, it takes you like two minutes to set this up. And uh, it's completely free, uh, but it's, it's not for production purposes. Uh, so you have also some limitations in place, like 25 megabyte storage, uh, no backup plan, uh, stuff like that. So it's nice uh, to start up with for training, uh, for doing some demos, uh, also with the latest version of Apex, which is running on, on 20.1 right now. Um, so that's a great way. Uh, if you're looking at uh, um, more options in your architecture in, in the cloud, then I would suggest uh, try out the Oracle Cloud Free tier. Um, Dimitri had already uh, a presentation uh, during Apex at home uh, regarding this topic. So uh, if you missed that one, I would uh, suggest to have a look at this uh, recording. Um, and there's a, a website uh, for that. Um, and what you get basically is at least uh, two databases with which each 20 gigabyte of, of on-conference user data. But uh, bear in mind that this is um, excluding the, the system data. So if you have a, um, some kind of gigabytes installed as system data in the system table space, uh, that gets uh, um, deducted from the 20 gigabytes. So you have actually a little bit less than 20 gigabytes of, of uh, uncompressed user data available uh, for each database. Um, yeah, what is the drawback of this free tier version? Uh, because you don't pay any money for it, um, you don't get a backup plan. So you have to implement a backup plan yourself. Um, you have uh, also the, the, the drawback that if you don't have any activity for like seven days, then automatically your instant will be stopped. Uh, and you can immediately resume the instant, but you have to you have to trigger it. Um, and if you have uh, rest have it for rest for a long time, then automatically your instance will will get dropped. Um, so Dimitri also here has an excellent blog post series, and uh, he has written about this. So have a look at that. Um, you get all the the various kinds of uh, tips and and possibilities uh, within the free tier uh, regarding the Apex installation. So it's quite nice, um, but we have also seen, and they are still valid, um, some nice alternatives. Um, I've listed some of them here. Um, possibly this list isn't complete yet, but uh, Max Apex, Refian, Skill Builders, uh, NCFA, uh, but also uh, a machine image on uh, AWS is available with Apex. So if you're looking for um, yeah, ready to go environment with Apex, for a small bit budget, uh, that can be a really good alternative. Um, otherwise, uh, I, I would say you go for the, the Oracle Cloud free tier. So this is all about the, the cloud options you may have. But uh, as we all know, uh, many data centers uh, at customer side are not in the cloud. So they have their own machines and they have own uh, maintenance on the machines. They install the software themselves. So uh, at some point, it can be that you have to install the Apex environment yourself. 
and uh, before doing this in a, in a real big machine, you can also try it out on, on your own laptop uh, to get started. So how does that look like? Um, you have your laptop installation, take you maybe two hours in total. Um, you install the Express Edition, uh, it's still on the version 18C, that's the latest version, uh, but there should be a new version coming out this year. Uh, of the Express Edition and with the Express Edition you get uh, 12 gigabyte of data for free um, and then you can install the latest Apex version in that PDB. Uh, I would suggest always to install the Apex version in the PDB. Uh, load the static files of Apex in that PDB and then configure your backup process. Um, of course you should test your backup process uh, and recover also from it to see if it's all working and if you're really competent with it. Um, so that's that's uh, the steps to undertake. It's very lean, I would say, not much to do, and it works uh, pretty great. So for uh, also for demo purposes, more or less in, in uh, on your laptop. Um, I have it, for instance, running in, in a virtual machine. Uh, it's a great alternative. And if the next version of Express Edition arrives, you can actually uh, transport those pluggable uh, databases to the next version. Yeah, so that should be an easy job uh, to do, to transfer to the, the next version. Um, so I would recommend also to have a look at the blog post from Johannes Ahrens. Uh, he did a great writing uh, on, on maintaining, administrating also the, the Express Edition of, of Oracle. Okay, so now we warmed up uh, on, on a laptop. So let's take it to the next level. Uh, so you have all those nice machines running in your data center and you would like to have a proper development test environment and production environment uh, installed. So um, this is the, I would say the minimal server installation. Uh, this will uh, take you about eight hours in total. Uh, and uh, it uh, comprehends uh, or it consists of the various steps here outlined. Uh, so we have an, an Oracle Linux server. Um, you can install it directly on, on the server or you take uh, a CentOS uh, machine. You can rent those for like 13 bucks each month and then convert CentOS to Oracle Linux. There's a nice script for that. Uh, you can see the link on the slide. And uh, as soon as you have Oracle Linux in place, you can install the, the database, you can install Apex, Tomcat, and configure deploy RDS on Tomcat. Uh, I would suggest for those proper environments, so uh, dev, uh, test, staging, production, uh, I would also uh, always use Tomcat um, as an application server. We have made very good experiences with it and also use OADS. Uh, so there's also other gateway possibilities for interacting uh, with Apex, but OADS is certainly the way to go. Um, then of course the backup and recovery process is part of it, and of course to secure your communication with the server, uh, you should always install an SSL certificate, in, uh, in this case in Tomcat. Um, no matter if you have an in-house environment or you have an external uh, public environment, uh, communications uh, should always be uh, secure. So in this case, with, uh, with an SSL certificate, uh, therefore enabling HTTPS. All right, so what I would suggest is go one, um, one step further. Um, so in this case, I would uh, not actually install OADS on the same machine as the database server. Uh, most clients already have this in place, so they have the database server uh, separate from uh, the OADS machine. Uh, the OADS machine is uh, most likely a virtual server, um, so they can easily spawn an, a new image if they need to. Um, and uh, they can also do cold failover on, on the image level if they like to. Um, so in this case, you have the, the same steps as seen as the previous slide, but then you have to uh, install also a proxy server in front of ODS, which is running on a separate server. And the reason to install <coughs> a proxy server like Apache Web Server, Nginx, or IS 
which is part of the Windows Server, uh, is, is for flexibility reasons. So in a match in a case, you're having uh, to stop uh, Tomcat uh, because you would like to upgrade Tomcat. Then the proxy server is still running and uh, requests coming from outside for an Apex page um, the, those users still would get a proper message saying, okay, we're doing maintenance work and they're not getting a hard message, error message uh, back. So this is one of the advantages you would have, but you can combine both advantages of both worlds. So there are certain advantages that Tomcat has and there are certain advantages uh, a proxy server has. So you can combine those two. Um, I would suggest, um, yeah, disabling direct communication with Tomcat. So normally Tomcat, if you deploy it, it runs on port 8080. Um, but if you have a proxy server in front of your Tomcat, I would uh, um, yeah, configure it in a way uh, that it runs on your local IP address of the server. So no external communication is possible anymore uh, directly with Tomcat. So each communication should go to the proxy server. Um, there's no real performance penalty by using also a proxy server. Um, some customers also have a, a hardware load balancer in place that acts like a proxy server, um, but that depends also on your on your budget, uh, what uh, what kind of way you would like to use um, and set this up. So this is like the the recommended server installation, I would say. Um, so if you're um, yeah, proficient with it, I, I would say like nine hours it would take you to, to set this up, uh, those, those steps. And um, yeah, it's, it's, we've seen this at, at maybe uh, 20, 30 installations. Uh, so it is, for me, this is like the, the standard way uh, to go. So what about single sign-on? I would, I would uh, suggest to always enable single sign-on for your Apex environment uh, and the apps that are running on your Apex environment. Uh, there are actually two reasons, big reasons to do this. Uh, actually for one person's purpose would be security. Um, so I still see a lot of environments where the authentication is being done using the authentication scheme LDAP. Um, you should actually not do this uh, because you have uh, most of the times you have a technical user that's being stored for the communications with uh, Active Directory or some other LDAP server. Um, and on the other hand, you have um, the, the end user entering a username and password of Active Directory, which is the, uh, yeah, the corporate password uh, that's being used for all the other applications in the, within the com, uh, corporate as well. Uh, and, and these credentials are uh, going uh, over the network to your database server. Um, so I would uh, not uh, recommend doing that. Uh, instead, I would uh, actually install single sign-on uh, to prevent using the LDAP authentication scheme within Apex. Um, Another reason would be productivity, because each time I, I, I install and configure a single sign-on at the customer side, um, the people start to smile as soon as it works. Yeah? Uh, why? Because we all know that like logging on in, in your Apex environment like, like 50 times a day uh, will cost you time. And if you uh, could actually enter the, the URL in, in your browser and you're immediately logged on, uh, that would yeah save you time uh, in, in in total. Um, so this this is also great for productivity, uh, also as an acceptance criteria for your end users to actually enable single sign-on. So there are multiple uh, ways to actually uh, enable single sign-on for your environment, and I would like to uh, go through three of those. Um, so the first one would be my uh, favorite one. Uh, which is uh, using the OAuth 2 protocol or OpenID Connect. They are more or less the same. I, I won't go into in details in that, uh, but Apex supports uh, both methods, uh, OAuth 2 and OpenID Connect. Um, so if you have an, uh, an authentication provider that is able to communicate uh, for authentication purposes uh, through OAuth 2 and supports this, um, then I would go uh, that way uh, and implement that. 
So why why is this? Uh, I see a change now over the over the years. A lot of customers are accepting uh, or adopting Azure Active Directory right now because of Office 365. Uh, so they are already familiar with the lock on process of uh, of Microsoft Azure AD. Um, they might have also features enabled there in that uh, Azure uh, cloud environment like application proxy. Uh, self-registration or two-factor authentication, which is getting more and more in common. Um, so if the users are already uh, used to that process, uh, why not actually um, let application or uh, application express be another environment uh, next to Office 365 uh, to do the authentication uh, using Azure AD uh, with, with OR2? and APEC supports this already uh, natively. Um, so I've got this all written down in a, in a step-by-step guide. Um, have a look at, uh, at the document. The, the link is here on the slide. And uh, let me know if you have any questions around that or if you have any problems, I, I will be happy uh, to help you. Um, so basically how it works is um, you have a request coming from the browser. Um, that goes to Apex and Apex says, oh, uh, you don't have a session ID yet um, because uh, for a proper session, you need a session ID and you need a session cookie. So Apex redirects the user to Azure AD. At Azure AD, the user is being logged on and an authorization code is then being redirected uh, back to the Apex uh, uh, environment. So Apex now has an authorization code and uh, actually sends that to internally to the, the Azure AD and then gets uh, an access token. And with that access token, it all also helps the, the username of, uh, of the Apex user and uh, it then can create the Apex session. So this is only happening back and forth for the first time. As soon as you're logged in in Apex, of course, then uh, no, no communication with Azure AD is then needed anymore, uh, as long as your browser session is still alive. So the next version uh, or the alternative would be using Kerberos. Uh, I would call this legacy uh, right now. So it's still a valid option if you don't have uh, um, ADFS or if you don't have Azure AD active in your, um, in your company. Uh, so you can use that. And I've written all a very comprehensive document um, that was downloaded like thousands of times already uh, in, the, in, the, in the last years. Um, and it will explain uh, step by step what to do uh, to set up um, Kerberos. There are actually two variants uh, in there. One is uh, with, with Apache web server and one is with IAS. So if you have a Windows server, I would uh, say that, that you should use IAS um, to, to get uh, the Kerberos authentication done. If you're using Apache web server, then you can use a module like mod.care for that uh, to use uh, the Kerberos authentication on, on, on the Linux environment. Uh, so the communication in this case is like the, the browser uh, sends is already logged in. Uh, so the, the client PC and normally a Windows PC is already logged in the domain. And with that, it gets a Kerberos uh, token. And this, this Kerberos uh, token is being sent to uh, the Apache web server whenever you access the, the Apex environment. And then uh, in this case with Apache, uh, takes care of it to check uh, with the domain controller if that Kerberos ticket is valid. And when it is valid, you get another Kerberos uh, token. Um, so that is then being sent for the next request. Uh, and then uh, you're allowed to go further. So only authenticated users are being allowed to actually access OADS and go into the, the Oracle database. Which, which can be an advantage of certain cases uh, in, uh, compared to OR2, where each request certainly goes into the database. The last uh, option you would have uh, would be to use SAML2. Um, I, I would definitely call this a legacy, um, but there are still authentication providers out there that don't support uh, the OR2 method. Uh, they only support SAML2. So in that case, uh, I have a third document in place where you can follow those steps in there 
to actually set up uh, your authentication of the Apex environment against a uh, SAML2 authentication provider. That can also be uh, Active Directory if you, if you like to. We have done this at a customer site already. Um, and in that particular case, we uh, brought it even one step further. They had uh, a big uh, five, uh, um, five IP uh, load balancer there. And uh, they configured it in such a way that they did uh, the authentication over there against Azure AD. So this, this might be an option for you in certain cases, but um, um, I would definitely recommend to use OR2. Um, the communication process in this case is a little bit different. Um, we don't have the token going uh, back and forward. So a request from the browser goes to the, the Apache web server. Um, and then uh, it all works with uh, yeah, encrypted XML messages. So an encrypted XML message message is being generated and that can only be read by, uh, by, by the Apache web server after authenticating uh, with the Azure AD. Um, and then uh, for that reason, also no backend communication is needed between the Apex environment and Azure AD. Um, so it is, it has some certain advantages, but uh, as I said, I would definitely say that OR2 is the way to go in most cases. So for those of you that are a little bit, uh, um, yeah, confused, what about OR2, Kerberos, or SAML2? Uh, I have written down as a recap my, my recommendations uh, and in that order, um, I would still, uh, I would definitely use OR2. Uh, if you have an authentication provider that supports it, um, you can use the social login feature. Um, you get uh, extra data during authentication. So if you need a cross center or you need some email address or whatever, um, during authentication you can get this actual uh, this, this extra data from, from the authentication provider. And it works both um, in, inside as well as outside the corporate network. So we had also various customers that have their authentication provider inside the corporate network. And uh, as an Apex environment, we authenticate against that um, instance. So the, the name social login in, within Apex is a little bit uh, confusing, I would say. Normally you would say it's only uh, applicable to Facebook, uh, Google, and stuff like that but you can actually really good use it for Azure AD uh, or other uh, Java, custom Java implemented uh, authentication providers uh, that run inside your corporate network. Um, what it also supports, uh, and which, which is really great, uh, is changing the authentication method and runtime. So suppose you have a situation where you have not all the users running in, in Active Directory, you have some user accounts stored locally in your table. Uh, then you would easily want to switch between the authentication methods. So do I want to actually use social login or do I want to have a, a normal Apex authentication scheme in place or a local table with, with custom authentication? So with a, a URL parameter, you can actually switch uh, between those which is great. Um, it has only one drawback in the moment uh, with the current version of Apex still, uh, but this is planned to, uh, to change in the future, is that you first need a public page uh, to, to run that, uh, to get a session ID of Apex. And after that, you can use the URL parameter to actually change the authentication method. So you cannot directly call the URL with the, the parameter in there saying, hey, I want to do a different authentication method you first need to have a, an Apex session ID there for that in place. So the second option I would prefer where is, is Kerberos, um, and then uh, you use a proxy server uh, for that in front of it. Um, but there's also one drawback there. Um, we had some certain situations where a user belongs to many groups, saying like 100 groups in Active Directory. And then the, the Kerberos ticket gets really big. Yeah? And it gets that big that the Apache web server is not able to handle it anymore. So it actually cuts the, the, the Kerberos ticket. So it cannot interpret it anymore. Uh, in that case, the, the authentication won't work anymore. 
So be sure before you implement this, um, take a, a take a, uh, already a user in place that has a lot of user groups he belongs to, uh, and uh, make sure you test that out before you actually uh, go into production with this setup. Um, you won't have this problem with OR2, uh, by the way. SAML2 is, is what I said before. Um, you, you can do it, uh, it works, but I found it a little bit cumbersome to set up um, with XML communication, and it really feels like, like latency. Uh, so if you really need to, you can do it. Otherwise, I would go for OR2. So my, uh, my last point uh, would be about high availability. Um, so we have not talking, uh, talked about high availability yet. Um, so I have one architecture also I would like to share with you, which, uh, which shows how a uh, high availability architecture could look like. Um, as the door says, yes, we are open. Yeah? And if you're looking for a solution that needs to be open, uh, available for 24 hours, seven days a week, um, then this could be an option for you. Yeah? It is not the only option, but it, it could be an option. Um, so in this case, um, we have a, a different setup. Of course, it's, it's a little bit complex, um, complicated. Um, so and you need also various kinds of uh, specialists uh, for this to work. So let's let's start on the bottom. Uh, you see the Oracle Rack, the real application cluster. Um, that's something most of you, um, I, I think, are aware of how this works. Uh, you can do several presentations on that topic alone. Um, but in, in general, um, it, it makes sure that you have high availability in place on on database level, which is great. Uh, but of course, you need a storage for that. Um, you need an extra piece of software, clusterware, and that. Um, so it takes some time to set this up. Uh, it's not something you do in like a few hours. Um, and of, of course, if you're working for a bank or stuff like that, uh, so, so these branches, um, they also have the need for, for disaster recovery and due also to legal reasons. So most of the times they have uh, more than one data center in place and then uh, all the messages are being transferred from one database uh, to, to the other one in the, in the data center, uh, the second one. And this can be achieved using Oracle Data Card uh, or some kind of other method. Um, so this, you can actually duplicate this whole architecture um, as seen here on this slide uh, in, in your uh, second data center. Uh, to make this uh, disaster recovery uh, in place. So uh, when we have a look at uh, the Kubernetes uh, cluster, um, Docker, I, I assume you're already familiar with that. Uh, Will Hartman did some great presentations on, on Docker already. So I suggest you have a look into that. Um, and the nice thing with, with Docker is uh, you can actually run uh, various kinds of services in there. And you can bundle them together as, a, as one surface that is made highly available uh, by Kubernetes. Uh, and uh, Kubernetes is an, an, all, an cost free um, open source solution you can use. Uh, it has some masters running in the background that make sure that those services you deploy are uh, actually uh, available and started again if they're not available. And within the service, you have one or more pods, as you call them, uh, with, with the services running inside of them. Uh, um, in this case, we have the, the service Tomcat, which you, of course, need. Yeah, you need the connection pooling with the database, with OIDS, that runs on Tomcat. And you optionally might have a service called Web for uh, Web Proxy or uh, other services in, in front of that. And they all contain different kind of uh, pods. And if one pod goes down, then Kubernetes automatically spawns a new pod for you, uh, running that exact same kind of service uh, you would be needing. Um, so between the, the Kubernetes cluster and Oracle Rack, of course, you have a load balancer um, to, to actually um, yeah, go from one network to the other and, and uh, spread the, the packets uh, to, to the various kinds of servers. Uh, with containing the virtual IP. And you have uh, on the outside, you have ingress where you expose your services from, from the Kubernetes cluster to the outside world. Um, so 
That being said, um, as I was uh, preparing myself for this presentation, I had various kinds of talks with some kinds of, of specialists within our company. On, on one hand, uh, we had uh, the Orco Rec specialist, and on the other hand, we had the Kubernetes specialist. Um, and I definitely have to say that if you're looking into this kind of architecture, you need uh, at least three, maybe four specialists to get that all working and all maintained. You know, so this is not an easy setup and it's, it's specifically targeted to those kinds of business that have uh, mission critical Apex applications running uh, in, in their environment uh, that should be uh, up and running 24 hours a day at least or uh, at best uh, seven days a week. Um, Okay, so some some final random thoughts uh, I had. Um, so this this presentation was not about uh, security as such. Uh, there will be another one coming up. Uh, you see it on the bottom of this slide. This is the, the Apex Security Checklist by Scott Spandolini. So if you're interested in, in security, I would definitely watch that one. Um, but if you're looking at an internet facing environment, um, then I would suggest also to have a look at some other service providers like Cloudflare. Um, because when you're looking at an internal environment, then it's all fine. Yeah? Then all those employees are most of the times, I would say, trustworthy. But if you have an internet facing environment, you don't know your user anymore. Um, so you can easily have a hacker that does a denial of service attack uh, to your environment. And those uh, service specialists like, like Cloudflare are actually uh, specialized on that. So they will take care of those uh, denial of service attacks and uh, make sure that your environment uh, on, on the back end is, is running as it should be. Um, so if you're looking at internet phasing environments, have a look at those uh, propositions from those uh, services providers. Um, they could uh, actually um, help you quite a lot. And I know that Oracle also is uh, relying on some of those uh, services. Um, consider using the Oracle data card. Um, yes, if you want to uh, replicate your environment or you have to want to do uh, a cold failover of your database. Um, so an active passive um, mode that, that is an option. Uh, Oracle Data Card is only available for the Enterprise Edition. So if you're looking for a standard edition a solution, uh, I would suggest have a look at DB Visit. Uh, they have also a great solution in place uh, to make this possible. Um, Adrian PNG, um, great guy that has a lot of uh, thoughts and, and work uh, spent in, in single sign-on and architecture as well. Um, he had made a, a great presentation, uh, a webinar, uh, who is who in Apex. So have a look at this presentation as well if you're interested in Apex architectures. And uh, regarding Apex at home presentations, uh, there are a few more I would like to recommend. Um, of course, Dimitri Gilles already gave his talk about the bring the light in your always free autonomous uh, cloud, but it will be available as a recording, um, so have a look at that. And upcoming still is the presentation from uh, Martin Givide Souza um, about social login, um, uh, especially also talking about the, the Google authentication using uh, social uh, sign-in of the Apex feature. Um, and Scott Spinellini I've already talked about. So with that, I'm, I'm uh, coming to the end of my presentation, um, and we can go into questions mode. So Carsten, any, any questions already? You're still mute? Yes, thank you very much for your um, presentation. Let me just um, walk um, through the um, question. Oh, and sure. uh, I have um, one question here, which is um, which uh, is a good starter. Um, would you recommend Tomcat over WebLogic or WebLogic? Or what are your experiences uh, when talking to customers uh, about the actual web server in, into which to uh, which to yeah. deploy odds in? So if I, if I was to work for Oracle, I, of course, I would say WebLogic Server. That, that would be the answer. Yeah, that would be everything. Uh, 
Um, but I'm not working for Oracle, not anymore. I've used to work two years for Oracle. So nowadays, I would definitely recommend uh, a, a Apache Tomcat uh, using that. And uh, this is being used in all our Apex environments, uh, at least I'm aware of. In, uh, uh, and I would definitely recommend using that. Okay, another question is uh, regarding, um, no, wait a moment, it's um, jumping around. Um, so another question is about um, Azure or Office um, 365. Um, um, is, uh, is there a way to work with user IDs which are not email addresses? Do you have experience with that? Oh, that's a good question. So right now, I've, I've always seen email addresses being used, and I believe that's that's actually the standard in Azure AD. And actually, you should use an email address because an end user is already used to that. Uh, so why should we use something else? Um, I can say um, in, in some other companies, it's held different. And then uh, confusion takes place because uh, still uh, an ad and then the domain name is needed, but in front of the domain there is an, another attribute being used. So this only c gives you confusion. Uh, but the email format, uh, as I'm aware of, is uh, actually uh, needed. And I've seen it in, in all all the kinds of implementations that an email address was being used. Yeah. Okay, thank you. So let me look at the, so this was answered. Um, so another question about uh, sign-on. Um, do you know if an Apex app can use the Google authentication from the always free autonomous database? Or do you even have experience with that? Well, personally, I don't, I don't have experience in, in that combination, but I know that Martin Givizusa uh, does his uh, talk about uh, Google authentication, and uh, you can also do it from the autonomous uh, database, of course. So no matter if your, your database is residing uh, on-premises or in the cloud, uh, you can actually use the OAuth2 method. Um, to, to do Google authentication. I'm not sure with a free autonomous uh, cloud if you actually have the, have the rights to do everything that's needed there. But uh, I'm sure that, that Martin can also cover this, this question later on. Okay, that's something. The next question is uh, something which um, might be a recap of uh, some of your previous slides. Um, a general size. So we've seen a lot of architectures in the previous slide. So uh, here um, a pretty straight question. So we have about 50 users. What would yep. you consider as a general rule? So uh, from your architecture slides, um, so about for rather small to medium uh, environments with let's say 50 yeah. users. All right. So, so every environment uh, in, in my perspective should look uh, like, like this. Yeah. Uh, so this is definitely recommended, even though you have like less users, uh, doesn't matter. Um, if, if you don't have the budget to actually have two servers in place, then, then of course you can do this. Um, but uh, in, the, in the end, uh, I see most of the customers doing this kind of uh, scenario. Uh, but, but this is not uh, including high availability. This is not including disaster recovery. This is not including security topics. Um, so uh, in, in internet facing architectures. So, but in, in a standard uh, internal environment, uh, I would definitely say this is the way to go. Yeah. And, and you see kinds of variations, uh, somebody saying, okay, I use Nginx as proxy server. Uh, the other one says, no, we have IAS in place as proxy server. The other one says, no, I have a Linux and I want to have an Apache web server as proxy server. So there you see some variances and also the protocol being used between the proxy server and Tomcat. Somebody uh, is, is lean on, on HTTP using that as a protocol and others are, are using a HTTP, the Apache JSERF protocol, which is a binary protocol. Uh, I'm, I'm fine with both of them, uh, so whatever suits you, uh, you should take. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, I have another one here, which is also a great opportunity to perhaps share some of your experience of your Apex development team. Somebody asks, um, I need a local installation of Oracle Database and Apex on my MacBook. What possibilities do I have? Docker, virtual machines, something else? And I think that's a great uh, opportunity maybe to share a bit 
how are you doing it? So uh, how are your developers in your team uh, building Apex on their local machines, how they are doing development? Mm -hmm. Okay. So what I have running uh, on, on my machine is, is actually an image. Um, uh, and I use Parallels as software on my MacBook Pro. Um, and it works out great. So I have both a, a Windows uh, image there, I have a Linux image there, and that's all I need. Uh, I, I know of several uh, other colleagues, they use uh, Docker very intensively um, to spawn uh, easily uh, multiple Docker images, uh, which, which is fine, if you, especially if you need to have uh, all the, the versions of Apex in place and you need to start up quickly a specific version of Apex, then, then Docker could be helpful for you. Um, but that's the way uh, I'm, I'm using it and, and I'm, I'm, I'm happy with that. So, but you have various options. There are also ready to go images on, uh, on oracle.com, which you can download and use uh, in conjunction with the, the Oracle uh, server, uh, VM server. Um, so you have different kinds of options, but if you're really new to Apex, then I would definitely not bother with that. I would definitely go with apex.oracle.com and start developing because that's what, what most people like to do and, and should do. Yeah, uh, but uh, as I said at the beginning, I, I think it's still uh, important that developers are aware of the architecture and, and know uh, how it works uh, internally uh, under the hood. So that this helps you quite a bit if you're in uh, facing a certain problem, then you can analyze a lot quicker because you know what, what happens under the hood. Uh, it's the same thing when your car breaks down. Yeah, it helps when you have some basic knowledge about the car, what could be the case and how can I fix it? Okay. Okay, I think um, one last question, um, which uh, is of value for really everybody. Um, so you were just saying before um, that uh, your general recommendation is Tomcat, just for practical reasons as well. Um, is there something uh, which comes to your mind, a setting some best practices, how to set up your, uh, your Tomcat server uh, to have good performance? Or is there some best practice which you would say, oh, think about this and uh, do, uh, don't do that? Is there some real um, obvious thing which you would like to uh, share with at least? Yeah. Okay, so, so the, the one major thing I, I would like to, to repeat is, is don't use the LDAP authentication in your Apex environment, but instead use a single sign-on solution. Uh, and, and that should be the standard. Yeah, that's, that's the most important thing uh, you should do. You can actually enable single sign-on also on workspaces uh, so in your internal workspace. So also for developers, they can actually switch easily between the workspaces without authenticating again. Um, and the rest, the, the, the more in detail, how you actually configure the Apache web server, how you configure the Tomcat, that's all written in the documents I've already uh, in the slides. Uh, you, you can look over that. Um, but Mm, as besides the connection pooling, that should be having a, a specific size. Yeah, that's that's important. But other than that, it's it's not really critical, I would say. Yeah. So um, if you enable caching on the Apache web server, of course you can do that. But what would be the real win about that? Yeah, it's not a huge performance win uh, for an Apex development uh, environment. So. Um, as said, my, my tip number one would be actually to enable single sign-on for your Apex environment and uh, get rid of the LDAP education process. Okay, I have seen one more question, which is pretty interesting, uh, also probably for most of the attendees, um, and the, that is a comparison of the architectures you have shown here compared to uh, Oracle Cloud offering. Um, do you have um, discussed that with customers uh, in the past, uh, your architectures uh, on-premises versus uh, cloud architectures? And uh, if there's some experience you would like to share here. Okay. Um, well, it, it's, it's not really about um, the, the discussion cloud or not. I mean, most of the times the database is residing on-premises still, at least in, in Germany is what I see. Um, 
So when the database lies on the premises, why would I install Apex in, in the cloud? Yeah, it doesn't make huge sense. So from a performance perspective, it would be better to put them together, the data next to Apex in the same database. Um, and as I always say, it's like the, the best architecture is where you cannot delete one component anymore. So it's the minimal architecture uh, that's actually the best. Um, so um, depends on, on actually your use case. We have some customers, of course, that don't have an, a database administrator. Uh, they have a small budget and those are using, uh, so some of them of, of our clients are using uh, Max Apex as an, an offering, uh, which, which costs you maybe like 50, 60 bucks each month and, and, and you're good to go. Yeah, so that's fine. And we have also some customers that have rented for like 13 bucks a month uh, Linux environment and we do the whole maintenance of the whole software on that. Um, so it's it's more like what are you willing to pay what what is the the apex environment about is this highly critical or not um, so of course large corporations have much more budget and they invest a lot more in their hardware and in in their architecture as well so um, it's it's not an, an easy question to uh, to answer but I will assume that. Um, in the next couple of years, we will definitely see uh, the OAU2 authentication method uh, against Azure AD more widely adopted, uh, for sure. Um, and we get more and more services in the cloud as well. Um, but it will surely take some time to get all the Oracle databases in the cloud, yeah, for sure. But um, yeah, depends on your use case, of course. Okay, time's almost up. So thank you very much for uh, your presentation and for the Q and A. And it's now yeah. it's now seven thank to you. seven. Let, let me uh, let me uh, give one shout out to to Christian Neumüller. Uh, he helped me quite a lot with the OR two document. Uh, so Christian, great job you have done there and uh, and still doing. So uh, keep up the good good work. Um, and it's uh, in general a great Apex team to work with because each time I have a question, I immediately get an answer. And this is uh, one of a kind. So way to go. Thanks. Thanks for having me. And thanks for organizing this. Uh,